it is 11 o'clock. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry deals with G-protein coupled receptors. The picture behind me shows you the latest development in a long series of developments that have taken place over the past few decades and summarizes work that has been made by this year's two laureates. The G-protein coupled receptors are an ingenious set of operators in a system that works in a modular fashion in all multicellular organisms, making it possible for our, one part of our body to understand what's going on in another part and to send signals to tell what to do. Rather much like the captain of an old sailing ship shouting, set the sails, and you've all seen what happens in the movies. Well, some people enter the rigging, others start pulling on ropes, and half of them start singing chanties, just from one single order. The same thing in our bodies. If adrenaline goes out into our bodies, it elicits different responses to our vision, to our muscles, to our hearts, and so on. The laureates, uh, Robert Levkovitz and Brian Kobilka, have been part of this development from the very beginning, and they have been leading the way. Our first lecturer, uh, Robert Levkovitz, was born 1943 in New York. He received his MD from Columbia University in New York. He is a Howard Hughes investigator. Um, he works as, you see all his titles here, the Medical Institute, James B. Duke Professor of Medicine, Professor of Biochemistry at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, New York City. Sorry, North Carolina, thank you, the USA. But of course, above and all, he's a scientist. So welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Needless to say, it is a real pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. The idea of receptors has fascinated scientists for more than 100 years. And it's obviously fascinated Brian Kobilka and myself for the entirety of our research careers. Now, today we know that one family of receptors that you've just heard about, the G-protein coupled receptors, also known as the seven transmembrane receptors, represent by far the largest, most versatile, and the most ubiquitous of the several families of plasma membrane receptors. They comprise almost a thousand genes in the human genome, and they regulate virtually all known physiological processes in humans, including our senses of taste, smell, and vision. They also are the commonest target of therapeutic drugs, accounting for perhaps 50% of all prescription drug sales in the world. Now, despite the very central position of research on these receptors in current biomedical research, it's really only in the last 30 years or so that there's been any general agreement that they even existed. Prior to that time, uh, their very existence was a subject of much controversy and skepticism. Perhaps the earliest explicit suggestion that there might be such a thing as a receptor was made by the famous British pharmacologist J.N. Langley in 1905. He wrote, so we may suppose that in all cells, two constituents at least are to be distinguished, a chief substance, which is concerned with the chief function of the cell as contraction and secretion, and receptive substances, which are acted upon by chemical bodies and in certain cases by nervous stimuli. The receptive substance affects or is capable of affecting the metabolism of the chief substance. So here we have the first explicit suggestion of a receptor in terms of a, a particular uh, item which is able to both interact with the stimulus, bind it presumably, and then act on the cell to change its actions. But this idea of a receptor was not widely accepted, and in fact it was in general ignored or derided. As an example, uh, Langley's student, ironically, Sir, Sir Henry Dale, 
a famous pharmacologist who actually won the Nobel Prize for his work on cholinergic transmission, had this to say 40 years later about his mentor's receptor idea. It is a mere statement of fact to say that the action of adrenaline picks out certain such effector cells and leaves others unaffected. It's a simple deduction that the affected cells have a special affinity of some kind for adrenaline, but I doubt whether the attribution to such cells of adrenaline receptors does more than restate this deduction in another form. Now, even more ironic, perhaps, is this next statement by the very famous American pharmacologist of the mid-20th century, uh, Raymond Alquist. Now, Alquist, in 1948, published a seminal paper for which he won the Lasker Prize, in which he suggested, based on conventional pharmacological studies he had done, that there must be two types of receptors for adrenaline, which he called alpha and beta. But his idea of receptor was quite different because 30 years later, as recently as 1973, he wrote the following. This would be true if I was so presumptuous as to believe that alpha and beta receptors really did exist. There are those that think so, and even propose to describe their intimate structure. To me, they're an abstract concept conceived to explain observed responses of tissues produced by chemicals of various structure. He actually wrote this after serving on a symposium with me in which I presented some of my earliest work. <laughs> so, it was against this background of real skepticism about the existence of receptors that those of us who were interested in bringing these mythical molecules to life uh, began the work some 40 years ago in the early 70s. And it was clear to all of us, I think, at the time, that if we was to succeed in proving their existence, we would need to develop a whole suite of new technologies, which did not then exist. And the first of these would have to be some way of directly tagging the receptors for study. That is to say, radio ligand binding experiments. And so in the early 70s, together with student Rusty Williams and postdoc Mark Caron, we set out and were successful in developing radio ligand binding studies uh, for initially the beta adrenergic receptors and then the alpha adrenergic receptors. And with those uh, new techniques came the ability to study receptor regulation by a myriad of factors, the ability to discover new receptor subtypes, and interestingly, the ability to develop some interesting theories of receptor action. As an example, we found that in competition curves, antagonists, beta antagonists such as alprenolol gave steep uniphasic curves of a single affinity, whereas agonists like epinephrine or isoproterenol gave shallow curves, which in fact were composed of two components, a high and a low affinity one. Addition of guanine nucleotides such as GTP converted all the high to low affinity receptors and now gave us a steep curve. In order to explain this initially perplexing phenomenology, Andre de Leon and I developed the so-called ternary complex model, which proposed that agonists combine with the free receptor to form a low affinity agonist receptor complex. And then that complex further combines with another initially unknown component, we called it X, to form a high affinity ternary complex ARX. The modulatory effects of guanine nucleotides on the complex immediately suggested the idea that X might be the then very recently discovered guanine nucleotide regulatory protein. The ability of an agonist to drive the formation of this high affinity ternary complex is in fact a measure of its efficacy or its ability to stimulate adenylate cyclase. And in fact, the ratio of affinities of the agonist for the low to the high affinity form is a measure of its efficacy. And in fact, those affinities could be easily deduced and calculated from these competition curves. So what we had here then was perhaps the first direct demonstration of the mutual allosteric regulation of a receptor by its ligand and its effector, in this case the G protein, which led to their reciprocal ability to enhance their affinity uh, for binding to the receptor. But of course, one of the most important uh, consequences of developing these ligand binding approaches was that we were now able to tag the receptors to begin to try to isolate them. This was a truly daunting task. The receptors were little more than trace contaminants of plasma membranes and would require more than 100,000 purification and then only after we could find a way to solubilize them from the plasma membranes. Our ultimate success was based on our ability to develop uh, affinity chromatography matrices in which we covalently coupled various alpha or beta adrenergic antagonists to sephiros resins. By biospecifically adsorbing and eluting the receptors from these columns, 
And combining that with more conventional chromatographic techniques, after a decade of difficult work by numerous individuals in the lab, such as Mark Carone, Susanna Kotechia, uh, John Reagan, Frederick Lee Blumberg, uh, Jeff Benevic, we were able to purify all four adrenergic subtypes then known essentially to homogeneity. Three of those are shown on this SDS gel. They were all, as you can see, single polypeptides, glycoproteins of molecular weight approximately 65,000 Daltons. Each of these bound radio ligands with precisely the specificity that would be expected for the appropriate receptor alpha or beta. Still, some skepticism persisted. People wanted to know, could this isolated molecule also perform the companion function of being able to activate a specific process in a cell? That is to say, to convey responsiveness to adrenaline. To address this problem, a talented postdoc in the laboratory, Rick Serione, reconstituted the receptors into phospholipid vesicles. He then took erythrocytes from Xenopus labus, African clawed toad, these erythrocytes have adenylate cyclase and receptors, such as prostaglandin receptors. They lack beta receptors, and hence the adenylate cyclase does not respond to adrenaline. Rick fused his receptor-containing vesicles with the cells. They acquired catecholamine responsiveness. Subsequently, within a year, we were able to reconstitute the entire catecholamine-sensitive adenylate cyclase from three pure proteins, the beta receptor, the guaninucleotide regulatory protein, GS, and the uh, subunit, the catalytic subunit of adenylate cyclase. This work, which was done collaboratively with Lutz Birnbama and the late Eva Neer, proved once and for all that our isolated molecules were truly the beta adrenergic receptor and capable of performing both functions of the receptor. Now, with validated, authentic receptor in hand, we're able to use chemical techniques, cyanogen bromide digestion, we obtained several stretches of amino acid sequence, which enabled us, in collaboration with a group at Merck, to design oligonucleotide probes, which allowed us to clone the gene and the cDNA to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, the first ligand-binding GPCR to be cloned. This represented the first successful effort in our laboratory of a young cardiology fellow named Brian Kobilka. What we found in our paper in 1986 was that in the deduced sequence of the receptor, we could observe virtually all the now canonical features of GPCRs, the seven transmembrane spans, the interconnecting loops, sites for end-link glycosylation uh, at the amino terminus, and sites for regulatory phosphorylation on cytoplasmic domains. And in a remarkable surprise for us at the time, shown in blue, residues that were identical with the visual sensing protein, the light sensing protein, rhodopsin. 25 years on, people find it difficult to understand how this could possibly come as a surprise. But it really did to all of us. The reason was that at the time, there were only two seven-membrane spanning proteins known. Rhodopsin, the sequence of which had been determined only a couple of years before, not by cloning, but by conventional protein sequencing because it was so abundant, and a light-sensitive proton pump from primitive archaea bacteria called bacteria rhodopsin. Since both of these seven membrane spanning proteins were light sensing proteins, it was assumed that seven transmembrane spans must be the signature feature of light sensitive proteins. Only with our cloning of the beta 2 adrenergic receptor did the idea begin to emerge that no, perhaps it was a signature feature of G protein coupled receptors. Within the year, we could confirm that by cloning the alpha 2 adrenergic receptor based on John Regan's purification of the protein in the laboratory, and then the alpha 1s, and on to a total of eight adrenergic receptors that we cloned, as well as a serotonin receptor, three of those based on the difficult work of protein sequencing. And so over the next few years, the idea emerged that there was a large family of GPCRs all having seven transmembrane spans. Over the next five or six years, the family grew rapidly, as many investigators were now able, using homology techniques based on the early sequences that we and then others uh, obtained, to gradually enlarge the family. But almost never again was it necessary for anybody to actually purify one of these rare proteins to get the protein sequence necessary to do the cloning. And so we always felt very good about the 
uh, at least in retrospect, about the very difficult decade we had spent purifying these proteins, the sequences of which actually provided a Rosetta Stone, if you will, which allowed us to clone uh, receptors and, and then allow others uh, to clone the receptors in which they were interested. We next turned our attention to using several techniques to try to understand how this highly conserved structure, seven transmembrane spans, was specialized to perform these two core functions of ligand binding and activation of G proteins. We used site-directed mutagenesis and the construction of the first chimeric receptors, in this case between alpha-2 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Again, Brian Kobilka in the laboratory uh, led the way in this project. Alpha-2 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors are very similar in sequence, about 50% identical but they perform virtually opposite functions biochemically and physiologically with the alpha-2s inhibiting adenylate cyclase through GI and the beta-2s stimulating adenylate cyclase through GS. We were able to demonstrate in these chimeras that the simple insertion into the alpha-2 receptor of little more than the third cytoplasmic loop of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor converted its function from GI inhibitory to GS stimulatory. Over the next few years, much work from our laboratory and many others uh, led to the, uh, the current uh, ideas that the membrane spans and extracellular loops were responsible for ligand binding, whereas the regions shown in blue on the cytoplasmic surface represented the regions specialized for G-protein coupling. In the course of doing further mutagenesis in this area, uh, Susanna Kotechia in the laboratory made a surprising and serendipitous discovery, which was that Mutations in the distal part of the third intracellular loop, which would be expected to lead to loss of function, actually in some cases led to uh, the formation of constitutively active mutant receptors. That is to say, receptors which were active even in the absence of a ligand. At the time, we conceptualized this as being due to the fact that these mutations must abrogate certain intramolecular interactions within the receptor that confine it or constrain it to its inactive or R form as shown here, thus mimicking the conformational changes that agonists would produce when they lead to the R star or active form of the receptor which couples to G. In just a few minutes, my colleague Brian Kobilka will show you uh, how recent crystal structures have helped shed light on what the nature of those at that time unknown constraining forces and switches were uh, within the receptor. Interestingly, we now know that a growing list of interesting diseases are caused by such uh, occurring uh, spontaneous and inherited uh, constitutively active mutations in receptors. Now, contemporaneous with this work in the lab on the structure of the receptor, I had been very interested for years in trying to understand the virtually universal phenomenon of receptor desensitization, which is illustrated here for the beta adrenergic receptor in, a, in an isolated cell system. So when one stimulates the receptors with an agonist like adrenaline or isopropionol, cyclic AMP rises rapidly, but then even in the continuing presence of agonist, it rapidly falls almost to background levels. Here's another example for the angiotensin receptor with a different second messenger, a universal phenomenon. I've been fascinated by this phenomenon going back to the beginning of my career, and I think the reason is because it's such a classic example of what must be the most pervasive phenomenon in physiology. Namely, that when you perturb virtually any living system, it has myriad mechanisms which tend to return it back to its initial state. Let me tell you how we came to discover what is perhaps the major mechanism responsible for this desensitization. In about 1980, Jeff Stadel used so, some uh, probes, recently developed photoaffinity probes for the beta receptor, which we had just developed, to tag, to label, beta adrenergic receptors in cells which had been desensitized by exposure to an agonist, the beta agonist isopaternal. And when he ran those photoaffinity probe labeled desensitized receptors out on SDS gels, he found that their mobility in the gels was retarded compared to non-desensitized receptors. At the time, it had just been published that such retardation in gels was a, a fairly regular accompaniment of phosphorylation of proteins, especially membrane proteins. Accordingly, we labeled our cells with P32, and Jeff was able to show that the catecholamine-induced desensitization of the erythrocytes was in fact associated with phosphorylation of the receptor.
Over the next several years, a very talented graduate student in the laboratory, Jeffrey Benevic, was able to first identify the novel kinase involved in this receptor phosphorylation. We called it initially BARC for beta adrenergic receptor kinase. It's now known as GRK2 or G protein coupled receptor kinase 2. Jeff was able to purify it, isolate it, to clone its cDNA and show that it was the founding member of a new kinase subfamily. Now, contemporaneous with this work, uh, people studying visual signal transduction had found in a very corresponding way that the function of rhodopsin when it was bleached by light also seemed to be reduced by its multi-site phosphorylation and that enzyme had been isolated and was being called rhodopsin kinase. We obtained some enzyme, purified it, cloned its cDNA, Wolfing Lorenz did this, and found that it was a member of the same family. And so it became clear then that there was a new subfamily of kinases called G-protein coupled receptor kinases. Today we know that there are seven members of the family. Two, GRKs 1 and 7, are limited to expression only in the retina. Two, three, five, and 6 are universally expressed. Thanks to the work of John Tesma's lab, we now have crystal structures for most of these. This is the structure done 10 years ago collaboratively with my laboratory, showing the structure of GRK2 in complex with uh, G beta gamma, with which it binds to translocate to the membrane from the cytosol. All the kinases share a very conserved tripartite domain organization with a highly conserved central uh, kinase catalytic domain flanked by two regulatory domains. But it turned out that phosphorylation of the receptors by GRKs was not the whole story of desensitization. Something was missing. What I mean is that when Jeff Benevic was purifying this GRK2 or BARC enzyme, he found that the more he purified it, the more it lost its ability to desensitize the receptors in an isolated system. Suspecting uh, that we might be losing something, we kept trying to isolate another molecule. We never succeeded. But then, Hermann Kuhn, uh, about that time, the late Hermann Kuhn, published a paper showing that an ab abundant retinal protein, which was then being called 48K protein, or S antigen, somehow worked together with rhodopsin kinase to deactivate rhodopsin. And so the protein was renamed arrestin because it arrested signaling. This sounded much like what we might be losing, although, of course, this protein was limited uh, in its expression to the retina, so it couldn't be the exact protein we wanted. Nonetheless, I called Kuhn, obtained some of his protein, and in short order, Benevic was able to demonstrate that at high concentrations, it restored to our enzyme preparations the ability to desensitize the beta adrenergic receptor. Then, at about that time, Shinohara at the NIH cloned the cDNA for 48K protein or arrestin. Suspecting that what we might be losing might be not just functionally analogous with visual arrestin, but structurally homologous with it, we obtained his clone, and Martin Losey, then a fellow in the lab, was able to use low stringency screening to isolate a 70% sequence identical protein, which we named beta arrestin. Subsequently, Hovita Tramadol, a year or two later, cloned another such molecule, we called it beta arrestin 2. Now, with authentic, validated, recombinant materials in hand, and in reconstituted systems, we could show that with in this upper panel, with rhodopsin kinase phosphorylated rhodopsin, arrestin was very potent in desensitizing, whereas the two berestins were weak. Conversely, with BARC or GRK2 phosphorylated beta receptor, the two berestins were very potent in desensitizing, and arrestin was very weak. This showed that there was conservation across the, the entire spectrum, all the way from rhodopsin to the beta receptor, in this desensitization mechanism. However, as you can see, there was great specificity for the nature of which arrestin was involved. Today, we know there are four arrestins in this family. There are crystal structures available for all of them. Two are limited in their expression to the retina. Uh, all of them share the same fold. There are two domains, amino and carboxy terminal, consisting almost entirely of antiparallel beta sheets, connected by a flexible hinge region and stabilized by a polar core. So where this brought us to by the mid-90s was two paradigms shown on this simple cartoon, which are in turn based on the growing awareness that three families of proteins, and only three, share the remarkable property of being able to interact in an entirely stimulus-dependent way with virtually all GPCRs. 
And those protein families are, of course, G proteins, GRKs, and beta arrestins. Interaction of the agonist receptor with the G protein leads to canonical signaling through second messengers. Interaction with GRKs and brestins leads to desensitization by a steric mechanism in which the brestins block signaling by getting in the way of the G protein. But within the last 10 years, there's been a dramatic change in this paradigm as we have begun to understand that the GRK berestin system is actually multifunctional. Even as it desensitizes the receptors, it itself becomes a signaling system in which the berestins are able to act as scaffolds or adapters to bring numerous signaling proteins into contact with the receptors and set up signaling pathways. Some of them are shown here with their cellular consequences. Perhaps the most studied have been the ERK-MAP kinases. In addition, the berestins serve as adapters which bind to multiple elements of the clathrin-coated pit machinery, thus mediating endocytosis. So berestins, we now understand, mediate three types of functions, desensitization, endocytosis, and signaling. Now, in the course of studying this newly appreciated signaling through berestins, we made an interesting discovery five or six years ago, and that was of so-called biased agonists. Now, a biased agonist is a ligand which stabilizes a particular active conformation of a receptor, thus stimulating some responses but not others. Seven transmembrane receptor ligands, for example, can be biased toward a particular G protein or beta arrestin. Mutated receptors can also be biased. Now, in the classic model, two-state model of receptors, an agonist combines with a, uh, an inactive receptor, R, and drives it into the active R star conformation. All signaling is then a consequence of the concentration of this unitary active state. But the existence of biased agonists, which can stimulate signaling only through G proteins or beta arrestins, demands that there be multiple active states, shown here simplistically as two active states, one of which can interact with G proteins and one with berestins. By way of illustration, let me show you some simple data illustrating the ability of three ligands for the angiotensin receptor to promote interaction of the receptor either with G proteins, shown in red as second messenger generation, or with beta arrestins, shown in black. As you can see, if the ligand is angiotensin, a classical, unbiased, balanced ligand, you get very nice and very similar dose response curves for both G protein and berestin. If you use a so-called ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker, which are used in clinical medicine, of course, they're antagonists, and so one gets absolutely uh, no stimulation of either pathway. However, if one uses a biased ligand, this would be a berestin-biased ligand, Trevena 027, which is an octapeptide analog of angiotensin, as shown in red, it also does not activate G proteins. That means it's an ARB. It's a blocker with respect to G proteins. But with respect to berestins, it has very potent ability to activate. Now, I mentioned to you just a couple of minutes ago that one of the major consequences of berestin recruitment is to lead to signaling in a fashion which is parallel to, and in many cases, completely independent of G proteins. So, we were interested in obtaining and gaining a more global view of what signaling uh, due to berestins might be, might be like. And so, Kevin Zhao in the lab use mass spectrometry and proteomics techniques to map essentially all phosphorylation reactions that occurred in a cell when the angiotensin receptor was activated by a purely berestin biased ligand, such as I showed you, which can't activate G proteins. And I don't have time to go through it, but I simply want to show you that in this very diffuse map, you can see that there's a huge amount of signaling that goes on, all these phosphorylation reactions, many of which are very similar to or identical to ones which can be activated through G proteins. This tells us several things. One, uh, berestin-mediated signaling is very diverse and maybe every bit as diverse as G protein signaling. And two, uh, many of the same pathways are activated. However, almost invariably, when the same pathway is activated, there are distinct physiological consequences to the different subcellular distributions of the activated enzymes. So in the last two or three minutes, I just want to show you why we believe this new understanding of these signaling pathways may have implications for the development of an entirely new type of therapeutic. Again, using the angiotensin receptor as a model, when the receptor is activated by its natural ligand, angiotensin, we get activation of both G proteins and berestins. 
But the G-protein activation leads to vasoconstriction, elevation of blood pressure, which, especially in patients with heart disease, can be problematic. However, barestin-mediated signaling can be shown to have potentially beneficial effects, cytoprotective and anti-apoptotic, for example. Now, ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, as I explained, are one of the most commonly used drugs in clinical medicine. They, they are used because they block the potentially deleterious G-protein-mediated effects of angiotensin to raise blood pressure. But, of course, they also block potentially beneficial effects through barestin. So we hypothesize that a barestin-biased ligand which would, like ARBs, block G-protein signaling, but actually preserve or even promote barestin signaling might have added therapeutic benefit. In fact, it's been shown that such a ligand, this O27 compound, slows progression of heart failure in animal models, lowers blood pressure, and increases cardiac performance in ways that are not true of conventional ARBs, and is also anti-apoptotic. And in fact, such a compound is in phase two clinical trials for the treatment of acute congestive heart failure. Now, it's also easy to conceive that a G-protein biased ligand might be what was desired in some circumstances. For example, consider opiates, the most potent pain-relieving medications available to us. It is known that their very powerful anti-nociceptive or pain-reducing effects are due to activation of the mu opioid receptor and of the GI family of G-proteins. However, there are also very nasty side effects of opiates, as you know. They lead to constipation, respiratory depression, and tolerance, which is desensitization requiring more and more drug. It turns out that virtually all of those side effects are mediated through barestin-mediated signaling and are completely lost in barestin-2 mock-out animals. So one could conceive that a, a ligand for the mu opioid receptor, which activated only G proteins and not barestins, would have preserved therapeutic effect and markedly reduced side effects. So these are just two particular examples of how it might be possible to leverage this new understanding of these two parallel forms of signaling through G proteins and barestins, which was gained, remember, initially through biochemical studies, how it may be possible to leverage it to therapeutic advantage. Well, I'm out of time. Uh, and of course, I want to acknowledge all the many, more than 200 individuals, many of whom are here, uh, who worked with me over the past 40 years. Just to put up a, a list of their names, I don't think would give a flavor of things. And so instead, I want to show you a photograph uh, which is representative of the group. Uh, <laughs> this was taken 10 years ago at a celebration of my 60th birthday party at Duke, uh, at which many members of my uh, laboratory from previous years, more than 100, uh, came back to celebrate with me. And I do want to call out for special attention one fellow hidden away here in the last row. He is your next, he's your next speaker, Dr. Brian Kobilka. Thank you very much. And our next speaker here today is, of course, the second Nobel laureate in chemistry for 2012, Brian Kobilka. Uh, he was born in 1955 in Little Falls, Minnesota. Uh, he got his MD from Yale University, and he is now a professor at Stanford University. Um, it, I'd like to, to thank the Royal Swedish Academy for this, for this great honor. Uh, what I would like to do in the next half hour is give you a, a brief tour through my lab's efforts at understanding this really interesting uh, signaling process. Uh, as Bob mentioned, the, uh, the beta-2 receptor, like many G-protein coupled receptors, is a very complicated signaling protein signaling through more than one G protein and having uh, both signaling and regulatory interactions through arrestin. Moreover, uh, the, the drugs that we work with for G protein coupled receptors often have really complex behaviors as well, ranging from 
inverse agonists which inhibit basal activity all the way through full agonists. What I'm going to talk about today is really just a little piece of this fairly complex puzzle. And that is our efforts to understand the, uh, the canonical uh, signaling pathway of a G protein coupled receptor to its preferred G protein. So the, the next slide I'm going to show you is um, something that uh, I first uh, saw when I came into the field, and it was pretty much at this level of detail. It's, it's known as the G protein, coupled, or G protein coupled receptor, G protein cycle, where we start with a receptor that's inactive, uh, an agonist binds to the receptor, promoting an interaction with a heterotrimeric G protein. The, uh, this interaction then facilitates exchange of GTP for GDP. The G protein dissociates into its component parts, alpha and beta gamma, which are signaling uh, proteins. And then the timing of this event is dependent on uh, the hydrolysis of GTP to GDP, and the cycle begins. During the, the past uh, decade, we've made some progress in understanding the different components of this. That is, uh, at what, uh, what the three-dimensional structure of uh, an inactive receptor is. We're learning something about the process of activation by agonists, and most recently, uh, the structure of a receptor activating its, its G protein. And I'd like to tell you just very briefly about this, this really interesting story. So the outline for my talk is I'm first going to give you a brief overview of the approaches, the non-crystallographic approaches that we've used to understand structure and that have informed us a lot about how to, in fact, crystallize the receptor. Uh, I'm then going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, efforts to obtain crystals of, of the beta-2 and other GPCRs, and then finally, mechanistic insights that we've obtained from these structures. So. Uh, reviewing a little bit about what Bob talked about in, in his lab, the, the, the first clues uh, to receptor structure came from the clones of a number of the genes, and this is the, the 1986 sequence that was made possible by, uh, by protein sequence obtained by Jeff Benevic. And from this uh, nucleotide sequence, we can deduce the amino acid sequence, and then we can see within the amino acid sequence stretches of hydrophobic amino acids, which gave us clues that this was uh, a, a membrane protein, and uh, a multi-spanning membrane protein that, as Bob pointed out, uh, looks a lot like rhodopsin. And it also uh, taught us something about the post-translational modifications, glycosylation, palmitylation, and, and phosphorylation. Early experiments, uh, both chimeric receptor studies and site-directed mutagenesis, uh, we learned that the ligand binding domain uh, for, for the beta-2 receptor largely resided in the transmembrane sequences but on the uh, extracellular half. And domains involved in G-protein coupling specificity were primarily found in the ends of the third uh, intracellular loop. But uh, these approaches also were used to modify the receptor to facilitate uh, its purification. So uh, we, we found that uh, many GPCRs, and particularly the beta-2 receptor, does not have a natural cleavable signal sequence. And by inserting a signal sequence and subsequently a, an epitope for a, an antibody, we could both enhance the expression and uh, overall uh, processing of the protein and facilitate its purification through the use of an antibody column and at the end of the protein through uh, uh, a nickel affinity column. And using these approaches, uh, uh, we were able to use a, a multi-step uh, purification process, initially expressing receptors in insect cells, uh, solubilizing in detergents, uh, using a, um, an, a, an antibody affinity column, subsequently a ligand affinity column. Uh, much of the protein that's made in insect cells is not functional, so this is a key step in separating functional receptor from non-functional receptor. And then, uh, finally, a, a cleanup step, uh, a nickel column, and we end up with uh, pure protein that's almost 100% functional. And this can be used for a number of different types of studies, including biochemistry, spectroscopy, and crystallography. Very briefly, what we learned uh, from, from biochemical studies uh, is, is shown here, uh, mainly through the use of proteases, 
we identified uh, fairly large stretches of the protein, the immunoterminus, the third intracellular loop, and m most of the C-terminus that, that were susceptible to proteases, suggesting that they were uh, unstructured or flexible. And this is something that's useful to know when you're trying to crystallize a protein. But I think one of the, the, the areas that we learned most about the protein uh, was in the application of spectroscopy, particularly fluorescent spectroscopy, and more recently, EPR and NMR spectroscopy, to help us understand uh, dynamic properties uh, of the protein. And we learned, uh, as I'll show in a couple examples, uh, that there are ligand-specific conformational states, uh, there, uh, that the receptor is very dynamic and, and, and flexible in character, and that these spectroscopy uh, tools that we used uh, you ended up being very useful in monitoring receptor activity, uh, particularly in, in, in crystallography uh, procedures. Our favorite uh, model system involves labeling cysteine-265 at the end of transmembrane 6 with any of the number of fluorophores. And I'm going to show you two early examples uh, and the types of experiments that we did and the types of uh, conclusions we reached. So this is a simplest experiment, uh, uh, a type of experiment. And early on, uh, these types of experiments were first performed by Ulrich Gether. Uh, but this one uh, was uh, performed later in, in 2004. And we simply are labeling the beta receptor, a purified beta receptor with a, a fluorescent probe, in this case, rhodamine. And that rhodamine is in, in, tucked in in the environment of the, of the receptor. And when the environment, when the, when the structure of the ch receptor changes, the environment around the fluorophore changes and its intensity changes. So you can see here time zero, we add agonist, and we have this really nice change in the intensity of the beta receptor as a function of time. But this wasn't a simple um, exponential function. It actually was best described as a biphasic uh, process with a, a rapid uh, phase, and, and this is somewhat limited by the experiment, uh, the mixing time. So there's a rapid phase and a slow phase. And uh, as Bob showed, uh, functional assays uh, early on where we, we tried to model the receptor with a simple uh, two-state system, an inactive and an active system uh, state. And, and as Bob uh, pointed out, functional studies were beginning to su suggest that this was too simple. And these experiments, in fact, uh, were more compatible with uh, a sequential uh, model of conformational changes, agonist bind, some possible intermediate state, and then a final one or more active conformations. So this is, a, the, this is one of the first uh, biophysical evidence we had for multiple ligand-specific uh, states. Similar experiments uh, were done using uh, the same model system, cysteine-265, now labeled with fluorescein, and a different spectroscopic technique, which is fluorescent lifetime analysis. And the lifetime of a fluorophore, as its intensity, is very uh, uh, sensitive to its environment. But if one has different conformations, uh, one can often see multiple lifetimes uh, at the same time. So for example, this is a, um, the, a distribution of lifetimes in receptor in the absence of any drugs. We call this basal. And you can see it has a, a single peak that's fairly broad. And this would be compatible with predominantly one conformation, but a very flexible conformation. When we add the neutral antagonist, which uh, binds to and competes for other ligands, but doesn't change basal activity, it doesn't really change the fluorescent lifetime, but you can see it, it narrows the distribution, suggesting that its receptor might be becoming less flexible. What's particularly interesting, if we now add an agonist, isoproteranol, we see two distinct uh, lifetimes. Again, compatible with uh, what we saw on the previous slide, uh, two agonist-specific conformational states. And as I'll point out again, it suggests that an agonist alone can't fully stabilize an active conformation. Now, if we take another kind of agonist, a partial agonist that has some different functional properties, and look at its behavior, we see, like uh, isoproteranol, it has two peaks. And the peak for which we think is the active conformation is different from the peak for isoproteranol, suggesting that, again, yet another conformational state, that the, the active state for, uh, for this partial agonist is different from the active state for the full agonist isoproteranol. So we have evidence for multiple agonist states and ligand-specific conformational states. So these, 
these experiments uh, are, are part of a, a large number of experiments that we've, um, we've conducted over the years, uh, more recently including NMR and EPR spectroscopy experiments, which, uh, from which we have the, the following conclusions that are, that are both interesting of, of themselves and also relevant for, for crystallography. And the, the first is that the beta receptor is flexible and dynamic. And uh, as an example of that, is, uh, this is uh, a, a molecular dynamic simulation provided by um, Ansgar Philipson and, and Ron Dror at the ESHA. And this really gives you a sense of, of, of the, the dynamic character of the protein. This is about a 30 microsecond simulation. Uh, we found that transmembrane 6 undergoes uh, the largest changes in response to agonist. Uh, agonist binding and activation occurs through a series of conformational intermediate sites, as we've seen before. Agonist and partial agonist stabilize distinct conformational states. Uh, what will come up again is that agonists alone do not stabilize a single active conformation, and this is important, again, for crystallography. And then finally, uh, fluorescence spectroscopy particularly has aided in identifying the optimal conditions for crystallography. So now I'm going to move, uh, move forward and, and begin to discuss our efforts to crystallize the beta receptor. And I, I would say uh, we, our serious efforts began uh, at the end of 1990s and, and early 2000s when we were able to make sufficient quantities of protein to start uh, crystal trials. And our initial efforts uh, involved trying to crystallize the inactive conformation bound to an inverse agonist. And uh, this is one of the first uh, really exciting uh, observations that we had. These were crystals that we generated in around 2004 with uh, what we considered the wild type receptor. It had these tags on, but otherwise it was pretty much unmodified. And we were pretty excited. Uh, we were helped in this effort by Gephardt Schertler, who gave us uh, time uh, at the microfocus beamline in, in ESRF uh, because these crystals were so small and, and uh, weakly uh, diffracting that we otherwise wouldn't be, have been able to tell whether they're a protein or not. But we, we got this very, very uh, uh, weak diffraction pattern which was compatible with protein, uh, but only 20 angstroms. Nevertheless, we were extremely excited at this point because we had our first protein crystals and we thought that it's just a matter of weeks, um, but it wasn't. So what was the problem? Well, let's take a hypothetical GPCR that has uniform conformation, uh, really nice structure. If you have purified protein and the, and the structure is uniform, it should be possible to get high quality crystals because all of these proteins will stack together in the, in the same way. What we had, though, was a conformationally heterogeneous protein. And, and our, 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 our spectroscopy studies showed us that at least transmembrane 6 was quite dynamic and, and also heterogeneous. So now we have purified protein. It looks nice on a gel, but these, these it, molecules don't really fit together very well, and the crystal quality is poor. So uh, in addition to the challenges uh, of protein dynamics, we also had the challenge of the, the, the limited amount of polar surface area. Most of the protein was embedded in the membrane or for purified protein in, in a detergent mycel. And so uh, around 2004, uh, I'm sorry, 2005, 2006, we started uh, working on efforts to overcome this limitation. And we took two approaches. And uh, I was very fortunate to have two very talented uh, postdocs join uh, the project at the time, um, Soren Rasmussen and Dan Rosenbaum. And they took two complementary approaches uh, and actually worked together on both of them. The idea was to stabilize the dynamic component of the protein um, and also provide additional polar surface. Uh, Soren chose to uh, identify a conformationally selective antibodies, antibodies that recognized this region of the protein uh, in its folded form. And Dan chose protein engineering. And very, very quickly, they, they both succeeded uh, very close to each other uh, in, in time, and, and the, these two structures were published in 2007. The, the beta-2 FAB structure and uh, the T4L, uh, T4 lysozyme fusion structure, uh, it, it was really um, reassuring when they both came out together because we used two different uh, approaches and the structures were, were very similar. We, we lacked some of the, the definition in the ex extracellular domains, but the intracellular components were, were virtually identical. <clears throat> 
uh, in addition to these, com these, these tricks that we used to help get the structures, a another uh, important component was using lipid-based media. Uh, the original crystals that I showed early on were also uh, obtained in, in a mixture of detergent and, and lipid. The receptor fab crystals were grown in bicells, and uh, these crystals were grown in lipidic cubic phase, and this was done in collaboration with Vadim Cherisov and, and Ray Stevens. More recently, um, is in an effort to get our receptor G protein complex, we found that you can even put T4 lysozyme on the outside of the receptor and not have, and, and simply truncate the, the third loop, and you can get uh, crystals in this way as well. So this is uh, a summary of, of uh, the crystal structures, the inactive state crystal structures that we've gotten recently. Uh, and the T4 lysozyme fusion has been uh, the most uh, successful in, in our hands and, and probably in the field at least so far. You can see uh, the muscarinic receptors, two, two muscarinics, two opiates, um, and, and the protease activated receptor all uh, were obtained using this method. Also in uh, the Stevens lab at Scripps, uh, a number of other GPCRs have been solved using uh, this fusion protein strategy. However, I want to point out that other methods have, have worked. Uh, and this includes um, the use of thermal stabilizing mutations uh, to, to, to tame some of the, the dynamic character of, of the protein. Uh, has succeeded in, uh, in obtaining crystal structures of the beta-1 adrenergic receptor and adenosin A2A receptor. Uh, and this is, uh, is work from um, Chris, Tra Chris Tate and Gephard Schertler and their colleagues. Uh, and and I, I simply must point out that rhodopsin was first. Um, and rhodopsin so far uh, is the only GPCR for which we've been able to obtain crystals from native protein. And in fact, the very first structural information we have comes from Gephardt Schertler's 2D crystals, where he obtained these 2D crystals in uh, native uh, rod outer segment membranes. And the crystals that were obtained, the 3D crystals from Polchewski and Okada, also were grown in a mixture of, of lipids from, from the, the retina and detergents. Uh, and, and, and more recently, the active-like structures from Ernst and Hoffman were also grown out of protein purified from rod outer segment. So these, we, we believe that rhodopsin has an a, a unusually uh, stable character that allows uh, this type of crystallography to be performed. So I, I now want to get back to our, our efforts to obtain an active structure. And the first question that we had is, what do agonists do? Can we actually trap this state, an agonist-bound state, on its way to activating a G protein? And this, uh, this we worked on for quite a while with little success. We were not able to obtain any crystals of a receptor bound only to even a very high affinity agonist. And the first structure that we ultimately were able to obtain was uh, one uh, generated by Dan Rosenbaum with the help of, of Ralph Hull and Peter Deminer who developed a covalent agonist for the beta-2 receptor. And, and this crystal structure was obtained, but it was in an inactive state. So this gets back to uh, what we were learning from EPR, NMR, and fluorescence spectroscopy. And that is, agonists alone don't fully stabilize an active state. So this is a cartoon of a GPCR. I only have two transmembranes to illustrate it. But what I show here is that the receptor is flexible to begin with. And when you bind an agonist, it appears that the, the dynamic character actually increases rather than stabilizing a uniform conformation. And so to, to stabilize a uniform conformation, you need a stabilizing protein interaction. If, if this isn't a G protein, then you need to find some other surrogate. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had the good fortune of meeting Jan Stert, uh, who's, I think, here in, in the, in the uh, audience, who uh, introduced me to nanobodies. And uh, I can't go into these in detail, but they are remarkable. Uh, so they're, they're the variable domain of single-chain camelid antibodies. And by camelids, that include llamas. And this is pipette, the first uh, llama that helped us to get a, a crystal structure. Uh, and so in, 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 as a stabilizing protein, we were able to get uh, the first uh, active state of the beta receptor. And, and I'll just, just quickly say right now that this the nanobody stabilized state is extremely similar to the G protein state that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, something we haven't published yet is a partial agonist bound state, again, stabilized by a nanobody that selectively prefers receptor bound to a partial agonist. So now, on to the challenge 
of, uh, of the, the true active state, uh, the receptor G protein complex. And this is a project that's been going on, um, I believe, uh, since around 2006, uh, when uh, Roger Sunahar and I uh, began working together on trying to understand how we can um, investigate the interactions between these two proteins and hopefully try to get a structure. And this has been a really fantastic collaboration that continues to date. Uh, this turned out to be a lot of work uh, and, and, and very challenging. And, and I, I really uh, don't have time to go into the, this in, in detail, but I think it's useful to illustrate or to at least discuss some of the some of the important contributions to ultimately getting a crystal structure. So the first involved being able to identify a very high affinity agonist. And most of the agonists have, uh, even the best agonists have off rates measured in, in seconds or minutes. Um, uh, Soren Rasmussen screened compounds over 60 that were provided by various pharmaceutical companies and found one that had a, a, a dissociation half-life of around 30 hours. And this has been, a, a, I think, a, a really important component of, of the success. The other important component is getting rid of GDP. The complex that we form that's extremely stable is nucleotide-free. And even a small amount of GDP that dissociates, or certainly any other uh, GTP, destabilizes the complex. And uh, Roger and his group came up with the clever idea of adding a pyrase to uh, degrade uh, GDP, and it really is fantastic at stabilizing the complex. Other uh, important contributions are the development of new detergents uh, in collaboration with uh, Pilsup Che and Sam Gelman. Uh, we had access to these detergents, and they've really helped us stabilize the complex. We had access to uh, unconventional lipids for lipidic cubic phase from Martin Caffrey. These were critical. Uh, we also, again, had uh, uh, the help of Jan Steert, nanobodies that helped to stabilize the complex, uh, protein engineering, uh, T4 lysozyme on the outside, and finally, a really critical um, uh, a component to the project was the use of negative same single particle EM studies to help guide our, our, our crystallography efforts. And uh, to, to really uh, cut to the chase, we finally succeeded uh, in early 2011, and these were uh, the first crystals grown in the specialized lipidic cubic phase uh, uh, that were roughly, th these are relatively large crystals in fact, but we uh, were fortunate to have access to the Argonne National Lab uh, micro uh, crystallography um, system. And this is, these are, this is the crew after coming back from our last synchrotron trip, uh, uh, obtaining our final uh, data set. And, and this is Andy Cruz, Brian DeVries from uh, Rogers Lab, and Soren Rasmussen. So I'm going to, um, in the last five minutes or so, uh, summarize what we learned about the structure. So the, uh, this is the cartoon, uh, and, and now we have a, a three-dimensional picture, and there, there were some surprises. So first of all, what I'd like to do in the, the final few slides is take you from um, agonist binding to conformational changes on the inside of the cell to conformational changes in the G protein. And in this series of slides I'm going to show, the active structure is green, the inactive structure is gray. Uh, remarkably, there are a few very, very subtle changes in the extracellular surface uh, with larger changes in the cytoplasmic uh, domain. So binding uh, uh, here amplifies conformational uh, rearrangements on the intracell intracellular side. The largest change is seen at the end of transmembrane 6, as, as, uh, as evidence uh, predicted from um, fluorescence experiments. And you can see it's about 14 angstrom outward movement. This is from the inside of the, of the cell. If we start at the, the binding pocket, this is the inactive state bound to the inverse agonist carasolol, and the active state bound to this special high affinity agonist. And uh, when I'm toggling back and forth between these two, if you look at any one amino acid, it's, it's, it's really, there are very, very subtle changes. But what you can see is the overall binding pocket becomes a little smaller. And uh, I don't really have time to show it, but the extracellular surface of the binding pocket closes over. And ligand dissociation, even um, 
even small uh, ligands such as isopaterenol and epinephrine, uh, their dissociation, dissociation is drastically reduced because of these changes. And this can explain the high affinity state that Bob mentioned, the G-protein dependent high affinity state for Agnes, uh, has a lot to do with uh, the, the conformational changes that occur on the outside of the, uh, of the receptor that are transmitted up from the G protein. So the, 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 the changes in the binding pocket are really quite subtle, amounting to about two angstrom movement, the largest movement around serines 207, uh, which had been identified in mutagenesis studies as being important for agonist activation. So we wanted to try to see where these changes propagated into larger changes. And right below the binding pocket, there are a series of, there are uh, packing interactions with uh, highly conserved uh, amino acids in, in the family AGPCRs, including a proline in 211, an isoleucine in um, uh, transmembrane 3, so this, this proline is in transmembrane 5, highly conserved, phenylalanine 282 in transmembrane 6, highly conserved, and this phytogene in transmembrane 7. And I've gotten rid of the other transmembranes just for clarity. These packing interactions are really important for maintaining the receptor in the inactive state. And a simple movement of two angstroms at the top near the binding pocket is incompatible with this packing interaction. And a, a new arrangement is stabilized as a result of agonist binding. And so you can see, toggling back and forth, a small change in the binding pocket, a, a fairly large change on the intracellular side, sufficient to accept a G protein or an antibody. As I mentioned, though, the coupling between these is not rigid, uh, it's relatively weak, and, and we've not been able to get a structure of this really high affinity agonist uh, bound to the receptor alone. We need something here, and in this case, the, the stabilizing protein is not an antibody, but uh, is, is the G protein GS. So this, uh, in the last few slides, I'm going to show you the structural changes that occur in the G protein as it engages the receptor. So this is the blue, in this case, blue is inactive model, uh, a model of inactive GS. Uh, there are two major domains, the alpha RAS-like domain and the alpha helical domain. And between these two uh, domains is the uh, nucleotide binding pocket. And there's some really interesting details about structural changes that occur here that I don't have time to talk about, but you'll see a, a major, uh, major structural changes that do occur that are, are fairly easy to understand. So first of all, uh, I'll now toggle to the active state, and I'm going to toggle back and forth. And you can see the largest structural change is a very large movement of the alpha helical domain and opening up of the nucleotide binding pocket, which the nucleotide is then released. The other very large change is the C-terminal alpha helix, which projects into the core of the receptor and stabilize it in this active state. So this is the guanine-nucleotide-free, very uh, high affinity interaction. We were somewhat concerned about this very unexpected large movement of the alpha helical domain. And fortunately, as I mentioned, and, and this just summarizes th this movement, uh, about 130 degree rotation of this alpha helical domain. And this was really quite unexpected. Fortunately, as I mentioned, we had been collaborating with uh, Yorgos Skidiotis at the University of Mer Merigan, uh, uh, Michigan, and uh, his, his uh, graduate student uh, obtained a series of really beautiful single particle negative state images, uh, which, uh, and, and fortunately, we had uh, tags that allowed us to identify the components of this density as being receptor, um, a beta subunit, and alpha subunit. And what he was able to show is that, in fact, the alpha helical domain is very flexible and assumes many different conformations in a non-crystallographic preparation. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, we've learned a lot in the past couple of years about this really important interaction, the activation of a receptor in a G protein. But there's a lot we, we, we still don't know. Uh, one is uh, the, how these, two, how these uh, two proteins prefer each other, why a receptor, such as the beta receptor, prefers GS uh, over GI. Uh, we also know a little about the structural details of how a receptor is phosphorylated by GRK or interacts with arrestin, and, and there, there's a lot of work to do in the future. So I'm going to conclude with um, showing you, the, this is a picture taken last December, uh, at the GPCR workshop in Maui. This is uh, 
uh, many members of the Beta 2 uh, GS team, uh, and, uh, and many of whom are here. Here's Roger Sunahara, I want to point out, um, uh, uh, Tung San, uh, Bill Weiss, Yorgos uh, 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 Skiniotis is here, Jan Steer. Of course, I am, I believe, uh, 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 Soren is here as well. And, uh, and, and my lab manager, Fun San. And, and, and I just want to put up at the end, there, there, there are many too, way too many people to really uh, to have time to thank. But I do, uh, I want to especially thank my wife, Tung Sun, who's been my colleague, friend, collaborator, a great mother. Um, and as, as you, if you've read anything about me, you know that she's key to any success I've had. I want to thank Bob and, and the colleagues in the Lefkowitz lab. I, I want to thank particularly um, the people who uh, really helped me out when I started um, in the lab as a, as a very green uh, uh, scientist. Uh, Ruth Strasser and Susanna Kotecki really helped we learned how to do some things like binding. Uh, Jeff Benevic and uh, John Reagan and Mark uh, Carone really taught me the ropes of, of protein chemistry. Finally, um, my lab students, postdoctoral fellows throughout, uh, throughout the, my time at Stanford, and my two uh, closest colleagues, uh, Bill Weiss at Stanford, um, who uh, is, is starting to teach me how to understand uh, the process of solving crystal structures, but I'm still working on it. And uh, Roger Suna, Sunahara, a, a very a good friend and collab, uh, colleague who's been working on uh, G-protein signaling with me for a number of years. And th this is the, um, the Beta 2 GS team. I want to thank uh, my financial support from the NIH, generous gifts from the Mathers Foundation and Lindbeck. And uh, I, I just want to say uh, a colleague of both uh, 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 Bob and, and my and, and I, uh, Virgil Woods, uh, who's a really fantastic uh, mass spectroscopist, uh, passed away this year, and, and we'll, we'll miss him greatly. So I want to thank you for your attention. Let us take this opportunity not only to thank this, the two lecturers, but also to congratulate the two laureates. <laughs>